Hello and welcome to Lewis Nichols Live Stories. And I'm excited to bring on our guest today. Let's say hello to Lisa Mafia. Thank you Hi. for coming down. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. We've already had such a laugh. And I mean, your friend Jackie's <laughs> here as well. And I mean, keeping composed is difficult, but we're going to go with it. Um, so today's kind of like live stories, which we talk about your career so far, yep. where your love of music come from. So let's go back to the very beginning, <gasps> growing up. Where did your love of music come from? Were your family into music? Do you know what? I think I was a bit of a jukebox. Um, I have an Italian Jamaican family. Um, didn't really know much of my Jamaican side at all. Um, and grew up with my Italian family. And in the white household, I mean, you had from Duran Duran, Duran yeah. Pet Shop Boys, um, uh, all sorts of pop acts, massive pop acts. And over there, that's what we was listening to. But in my mum's household, we had a very sort of Jamaican rooted kind of household where we had rice and peas and chicken yeah. cooking on a Sunday. Um, and our music choice was a lot more black. So we had from Marvin Gaye to Michael Jackson to Louva Van Dross nice. and all them sort of sounds. So I came up in the music scene liking so much music. I didn't know what I liked, <laughs> if you know nice. what I mean. I kind of just... Liked everything. I knew every song. So w when you look at your like your love of music and stuff, you said then that you quite versatile with who yeah. you liked from. There wasn't a kind of theme as such. No. So did that help you become versatile as an artist? Because you you weren't stuck with one genre. Like you were quite versatile. Yeah. Once I once I came, you know, when you buy your own music and stuff. Yeah. I think I was very much into what I grew up on. So I grew up on revival and reggae soul r&b hip-hop but then when i came to like the raving days my first rave rave was like jungle fever <laughs> <laughs> at astoria in uh in in central london um and i guess my the influence from that is a very bashment it's very um reggae it's, it's, yeah. it's like dancehall you know um and a lot of the lyrics even na na ni woi, na 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 That's all like really reggae kind of influence, dancehall influence. And that kind of went into, into jungle. Jungle went into my lyrics. Um, I skipped kind of being into the R&B and hip hop. I came from the jungle straight into garage music. So when I done my vocals on my on a lot of my tracks, they were dancehall influenced. Do you know what's so nice? It's just how excited you got about music because it kind yeah. of shows just how <laughs> passionate you are. Um, but I want to talk about your kind of relationship with your family. So yeah. growing up, what was your childhood like? Were you close with your family, like your mum and dad? Like, what was your relationship like with, with each of those? So I never, I, I didn't grow up with my dad. I grew up with my sister's dad. And unfortunately, at the age of 10, he died of a drug overdose. Um, so I didn't have him around very long. But he was the father figure. My father had popped in and out. But to be honest, I was actually petrified of him because I didn't know who he was. Um, my mum was a great mum. Yeah. Um, worked for everything she had, never, never left our sides. Um, me and my, it was just me, my, my, my mum and my sister, my older sister, Kelly. And the three of us had a thriving sort of childhood up until I was about 11 and my mum got a boyfriend. But before that, we were great. Like it was just us three. So my mum done jobs that kind of, um, housed her daughters to still be with yeah. her. And she done a lot of child minding and, um, and odd jobs here and there. Um, paid at home jobs. We used to, I, I remember taking like the strips of these filing cabinet, these filing cases. There was like these strips that you had to take off. And for every one that we did, my mum got 50 pence. So me and my sister and mum was obviously like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, for hours, for days, doing hundreds and hundreds of these filing cabinets so that my mum would get a, this extra wage. And it was always around Christmas, I remember. So I, I now I look back, I, I know my mum was actually doing all of that to just give us a good Christmas, yeah. you know? And that, and, but at the time it was like, just doing what mum says, kind of, you know? Um, and my mum, as I said, my mum never left her side. If, if the biggest job that my mum did have was a childminder, and that was for a lot of kids that went to school with us in primary school and stuff. Um, and I think my mum done that because she wasn't willing to let us go, you know, like yeah. that. She was our rock, you know? Well, you said then, uh, up until you were 12, you were all very close. 
what changed? Like Mum's what... boyfriend, he was an absolute arsehole. If he's out there listening, I hope he hears this. He was awful. He he mistreated my mum from start to end. Um, and I think my mum was love blind, and she'll tell you that herself, you know. Um and I, I think it changed the dynamics of our family. I couldn't wait to get out of my mum's house by then. By the age of a, a 10, I was always uh, already making my exit plan to yeah. be an adult, you know. Just hurry up and let me be an adult. Probably hence why I had a baby at 17. Well, I want to I want to go into <laughs> that a little bit later. Um, and I want to talk a little bit later yeah. more about your mum as well. Because uh-huh. when you see you in other interviews and stuff, you've got this kind of... Very inner strength. Yeah. And I, I wanted to kind of explore whether that's from your mum, you know, yes, because she is. sounds like a very yeah. um, um, strong person. But let's go back to So Solid Crew yeah. because, I mean, that was just huge for you guys. But there was a lot of work you did beforehand, you know, on pirate radio stations. Yeah. It wasn't just kind of like, boom, we've been signed yeah. and we're, we're straight to the top. So how did you meet? Were you friends before? Okay, so I was actually, I met the boys when I was 13 years old, 12, almost 13. Um, I was hanging out with a girl from South London that I went to school with and her, her part of her family was one of the members of Sue Solid Crew, which was Mega Man. Um, and I used to go with her and pretend with my mum because I was very young, wasn't meant to leave the area. And I used to say, mum, just down the road. This time I was, <laughs> I was going clean from Brixton up to Clapham Junction to, to hang out with all the friends around that area. Um, and like a lot of the scenarios I've been in, I'm such a tomboy. I don't know how it happens. As much as I think I'm girly, I always end up with all the boys because I am a tomboy. I more wanted to be a, a boy than a girl growing up. Um, love to ride my bike, love to play football, um, love to steal bikes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was a little bit naughty to say the least. Um, but I was just so boisterous. Um, and I think I was also made that way through my family because I was the tougher one in my mum and sister circle, in our little family, our little dynamic, dynamic that we had. If my sister was in trouble, my mum would go and say, go and get your sister. And I was the little sister, even though I was acting like the big sister because yeah. I was tougher. Um, even when my mum had a problem, it would be like, Lisa, you need to come with me and we'll go down there. It was always me sort of being that protector in our family. Out of the three of us, it was the tougher one. So I think when it comes to my own life in general, I kind of was the one that thought I was the boy, yeah. the man of the house, because there was never a man around. Um, and that kind of happened with So Solid. I ended up going with a lot of girls into that, into that sort of, um, sort of uh, neighbourhood and ended up being the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> um, and ended up being the only female of, of a 30-strong crew called So Solid Crew as well. It's crazy though, isn't it? Because you just mentioned then that you kind of, you've always been like a tomboy. Yeah. And I guess growing up, when you grow up around a father, you know, you're kind of like daddy's little princess. Yes. And that makes you, I guess, that little girl. But when you don't have that, you have to essentially adapt and, and grow up quicker is that kind of what it was like for you I, I honestly that's a really good way to look at it I've never looked at it in that way to be honest I think I probably deny a lot of the daddy issues that I've got um just by choice um probably to protect myself and my heart um but yeah you're probably right it probably is a form of just ignoring the fact that you are not that girly because yeah. you haven't had that loving arm around you from a little girl. I've always been the one that gave the loving arms and the reassurance to my mum and my sister. And I was okay with that. I'm actually still okay with that, you yeah. know. Um, I love that I got to protect my sister, my big sister, my big little sister, I call her. She's shorter than me. Um, but she's my big little sister. And I love that I was able to let make sure she was always safe. I, I was going to ask, that. you know, being around all the guys, yeah. would they would there be that kind of protective element where they protect you? But it sounds like you you didn't need that. You could hold your own. You I know? think they obviously thought I needed protection, but they also knew that I didn't need yeah. protection because I could protect myself. <laughs> but there was there was that time where I was very sheltered, um, and I don't know if that was any good or not because being so sheltered within um, in the music industry can sort of hinder your possibilities of working with the outside world of music, which is vast, as you know. Um, there was lots of scenarios of people wanting to work with Lisa Mafia, and it was like, nah, you probably can't work because So Solid's right behind her. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And it wasn't until I went solo and um, worked on my own career that I got to actually work with outside people. But before that, yeah, it was very sheltered, very sheltered and very within camp only. But with So Solid, it was so fresh and so different. Yeah. I mean, there was no kind of group like yeah. this at all. So when it came to finally getting that chart success before 21 Seconds, yeah. I mean, were you guys like, wow, because to not only be accepted as a serious, credible artist, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I imagine there was a lot of barriers up for you guys in the sense yeah. of a bit of a bad image here they are trying to work in the music industry, but it was working. So yeah. did you finally feel like we're being taken seriously now, you know? Um, honestly, yeah. no, because um, before we started, we was already, already really loved and, and already st had our status on the underground. Yeah. And I think that that amount of work that we put in, the, the amount of units we were selling, on white label, with no late, with no record label, no publishing, no anything, no marketing or anything. We done the graft ourselves. We we cut our records onto white label, white sleeves. And uh, myself and um, G Man, which is one of the head of So Solid, um, we got a backfiring little white van for I think probably about 130 quid from auction, and we sold our records out the back of that van for the best part of a year to all of the underground DJs, outside yeah. raves, after raves and stuff. So we had, we knew we had done the graft to establish ourselves. To get that record deal at the very beginning, we didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. Because we weren't heading for that. We just loved music. So we didn't really, well, actually, maybe some of the boys did, but I can speak for myself that I honestly did not think about what, a record deal entails and that the commitment it entails or what the experience would be like because I never ever went into music in, in music to become a musician I just loved music well talk about 21 seconds because that was just huge I mean I know <laughs> Shane's already made like 10 jokes to you guys in the car yeah. but I mean it was so huge so when you before it was released and you yes. heard the finished product did you uh, did you kind of have an idea that this is going to blow or did you have I, no clue <laughs> Maybe the boys did, but I surely didn't. I didn't. I, do you know what? I'm going to be honest. I've never liked the fucking tune. <laughs> <laughs> I Are don't you know. serious? No, I love the tune and the fact that it brought us all together, but I don't know how to fucking dance to it. Well, you, you did well the other week with um, Anthony Joshua, but we'll go into oh, yes. that later. But... <laughs> I mean, it's a, I knew it was a great tune. That tune was created by G-Man from So Solid, um, Jason Phillips. Um, he, did, he knew that it took 21 seconds for each of us to create a lyric that's 21 seconds long to make an entire track. We had, we, when we done Oh No Sentimental Things, Oh No Sentimental Things was only myself and Romeo. We knew we had a whole load of artists that needed to be established from the So Solid crew. And as it looked at that time, it was only me and Romeo that was so solid. And we knew that the rest of the artists there needed to be established. But that was going to cost thousands if we'd done all tracks to establish each individual artist yeah. as we went along. So G worked out that 21 seconds each created a track of three minutes, whatever it was. And that if we'd done that, we could get every artist out at the same time. That's, That's right. bloody phenomenal, wow. isn't it? I didn't That's know that was phenomenal. behind it. So I didn't know that the track was going to be good. And didn't know it was going to be as big as it did. I mean, yeah. sell millions of copies. I mean, it's millions now. Um, I think it's triple platinum, yeah. that single now. Um, and we didn't know it was going to do that, but we did know it was going to establish, establish everyone. And I loved it. But I was like, how the fuck do you dance this? <laughs> <laughs> what move do you do? Like, Mm -mm -mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to say give up. <laughs> the words kind of back then, but yeah. it, it was so much harder to sell a record. It really was. It wasn't a few streams. People had to go out, physically buy the, the, the album and the yes. single. So to go to number one, what, when you found out, you must have been like, what is happening? Because the song's released, it was pandemonium, and then boom, number one. I honestly was the most scared of actually thinking, okay, so now it's this big. That means I've got to perform this so much more. And at that time, I just didn't have the sort of courage that I have now. I didn't have that bravery. I didn't feel like I, I deserved that sort of music position. I didn't know how to do it. I wasn't trained. I'm not a trained musician. I've had to learn along the way. So 
it's been tough. And, yeah. and, and that success at the very beginning, that was just like, it was, it felt like as soon as we made the track, it was done and was big, it was famous. It was like, okay, what do you do with this? What do I, how do I handle this? What do you do? Cause it's a lot yeah. of pressure. There's a lot of people wanting to talk to you and you don't realize why. You won a Brit Award as well. Yeah. That's just, and a Mobo. That's, do you still have that at home? Yeah, yeah, of course. Did you get one each? No. How come you've ended up with that? Because I'm the car. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, the next question, it, it's got to be yeah. so solid. We're just growing and getting stronger and stronger. Yes. The chart hits kept coming. So why did you leave? Me? Yeah. I never left. So, just got on with my own shit. I think what it is, a lot of people say, oh, you know, it can lease a former So Solid. For so Solid hit a really bad time. Everywhere we went, So Solid, if you were representing that brand, you wouldn't be able to play. My management at the time advised me in 2005, they advised me, don't no longer say you're So Solid. And I was like, part of my French. Fuck that. Yeah, because you're very That's loyal. Where, yes. Yeah. It's where I come from. It's who I am. It's what has made me. I'm so sorry till I die. I've got it tattooed on my bloody back. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to rep my crew. And when you are from the, the ghetto, as we like to call it, when you are from that sort of world, you do learn that loyalty will take you a lot further. Mm. It will take you a long way. So I was loyal to the bone, but I was advised constantly. And yeah. a lot of the time you did feel the difference in the switch of energy when you mentioned so solid to be just Lisa Mafia. Just be Lisa Matthew, they were saying. Just say your former So Solid. Yeah. And they were putting out that narrative. So as it went along, Lisa became former So Solid. But that wasn't by my choice. That was by management choice. Um, because there was so much negativity surrounding not only So Solid crew, but garbage music in general. And as they then categorized us into urban music, we became urban artists. That was made to destroy us, basically. Do you know, because when you kind of observe this uh, situation with you and So Solid, I mean, there was a lot of negative press. I'm not going to deny but, the amount of shit they've not got up to, but at the same time, that wasn't me and I, mean, I should have you, been penalised for If it. you look at the royal family as an example, yeah. if there's a scandal, they always kind of use William and Kate to yes. soften it up. And I yes. thought they did that with you. Let's get they Lisa did. to answer these questions. Even though you weren't involved, yeah. let's put you on the radios, in the magazines, and it almost protected the image. It almost makes me tearful for the amount of times that I had a huge record out. Um, I was selling absolute thousands to all my Did, fans yeah. and supporters um, on all the most incredible shows, winning MOBOs myself as a solo artist, being, tra you know, traveling, doing um, uh, shoots for Vogue magazine, center page with Mara Testino, doing all sorts of shows, Jonathan Ross, and they would still sit me down and talk about the negativity that was nothing to do with me. It was heartbreaking. And I think that's, that kind of traumatised me into feeling like, don't celebrate your career because it don't fucking matter. They don't care. Um, and then having to learn to remember all this amazing things I've done that I've got to be thankful for to God, one, for getting me through it. Um, but also for the industry supporting me yeah. and fans and supporting supporting me rather than being dictated to by the press saying, you know, oh, no, you're not good enough. We're not going to celebrate all the good things that you've done, only the negative. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's it's heartbreaking because I had to learn through that, you know. Did you, I know you're, you're very loyal and... But were there times back then, especially when you're, you're like you said, you're putting really incredible music out there and you've worked mm. so hard, clearly, mm. and all they want to talk about is, oh, what happened with this? What happened with that? Did you, were you ever resentful to the other guys and say, do you know what? I'm trying to do what I love here and I'm having to answer questions that I have no clue what answers to give because I'm not part of this. So, yeah, I, I mean, with the negativity around So Solid, what I did, what I, what I tended to do is actually just confront it. I was very, I was media trained from very early on. So I knew how to like switch a question back into talking about myself. But if they really wanted to pursue a question, I'd just fucking answer it. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than trying to not deny what the truth is or deny something you, you know, you've got a, an opinion about. A lot of stuff that was going on around So Solid was also put on us because at the time it was the most popular music being the rave scene of garage music. It was the most popular genre of music. Every single rave was still in the underground, Vauxhall, Brixton, yeah. wherever. 
there are people that are off the, without saying too much, a bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. And they were going to attend those raves, whether it was So Solid there or any other artist. What didn't help is the stuff that, that So Solid had to do to, to just because we were living. We became, we were, as much as we had this fame and fortune, we were still living very much in the same areas that we grew up in. So you're going to get confronted with the same people you grew up with that are going to be a little bit jealous. And some of us, some of them felt they needed to protect themselves from that. And that's understandable. That has kind of led us all down the garden path because we all had to confront, each time something happened, we all had to face up and say, do you know what? I don't believe that person's like it. Asha D, for instance, went to, to prison for a gun. Uh, G-Man went to, mm. pr to prison for a gun. And both of those scenarios, we had to sort of explain ourselves through, but there was no explanation for it. They just felt scared and, and wanting to protect themselves and ended up being caught and going to prison. So rightly be. Asha no longer needs protection. He's a big, massive superstar. And G-Man yeah. lives in Jamaica and he's very happy. So things happen. Well, when I was doing the research before this, obviously one of the main articles was the shooting, you know? Which that one? Was the, um, <laughs> which one? Which that's one? <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of other shootings that were nothing to do with us. And that's that's what I'm saying is that it didn't matter whether it was so was always or not. put on those articles. That's me. what's confusing. My grandmother once called my mum and said, what's happened to Lisa? Is she dead? It said, so solid shooting, Astoria, London. And there was a shooting about a mile away from one of our events. Wow. And they said it was a so solid event. And that's what was heartbreaking because there were certain things that were definitely, Asha D got caught with a gun, Jima got caught with a gun, but there were so many more scenarios that got put on us because of that. And mm. I think it's called scapegoating. Yeah. And they used us and abused us and but they why? used me to sort of soften the blow. But why did they you what 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 do they have against you to use you guys I don't the way think they did? I don't think it was anything against us. I think it was a scapegoat. Something all right, look like let me just strip it back. Honestly, media's got a job to do. They need to be paid. Yeah. Everybody needs to be paid. My beautiful face, my, my, who I am was easy to get that media attention. Put Lisa on the front and they're going to look at the story. They need to get paid. They need everyone to pick up that paper and pay, pay for that paper. That's their job done, isn't it? So whatever needs to be written in that article needs to be why they get the next job and they're the best reporter now, aren't they? Because everyone's got a yeah. job to do. And so using us at that time, as her prime, everyone talking about the negativity, it was the first of its kind. As you said earlier, it's the first of its kind. So solid. There was nothing like it before. And so it was a really cool story to yeah. look into. And everyone wanted to unpick it. But the only thing we did have that they could use that was negative is that the fact we were still from the hood and earning all this money. I think we were millionaires still living in the same slum that we grew up in. And, and with all the different things that were happening, how did you get them to look at the story? Okay, you use the girl. So they'll look at the picture because they like tits and teeth, don't they? <laughs> T <laughs> teeth and tits. Let's look at her. And then they go into the story and then they unleash all these things that may have happened around us or with us um, for the best article to sell the best newspaper, you know? Well, let's talk about your success because you left the, uh, well, you went on to do your own stuff. And debut single, straight in at number two. 90,000 copies in three days. That doesn't happen. <laughs> That's a huge thing. I think it when is. you actually step back and assess that, that doesn't happen to a lot of people. You yeah. leave it and it takes time. Yeah. So when you did that, obviously you normally have your boys around you. That's yeah. kind of a bit of a, a safety blanket. So what was it like to suddenly strip that back and it's just you? Oh my God, it's the scariest thing ever. Do you know what I realised though? Okay, so a lot of people think they are something, but sometimes they're not. As a child, you are nourished into thinking you are who you are, right? I was told a lot that I was very shy. I was told I was shy right up through to my teens. So I always thought I was shy, but then when I looked at it, when I became a musician and famous, and I was able to go out on stage and do all these things that I'm doing, 
I'm like, how can I be shy? Yeah. That's not a trait of a shy person. But when I first came into the industry, I thought I was shy. So it was so difficult because having the boys behind me gave me the courage, encouragement that I thought I needed until I went solo and I was like, oh my God, I'm so scared. I literally went into press rooms sometimes not knowing what my name was. Like, okay, can you just say your name, introduce yourself and tell us about your record? I'm like, Oh. literally word from it thinking that I was shy and it took me some, some time to realize oh my god I love this I love the attention I love what I'm doing I love music I'm just doing what I like so I had to build this sort of like courage after the boys left well after I left them <laughs> that's incredible but that's the thing you know because you, you've gone and done that yeah you've had the success with so solid mm. crew so was that an element of this has got to work because if i put something out on my own and it flops i'd be mortified no i never care Were you just excited I, I never care i always believe in the music industry in any industry if you're not doing what you love then don't do yeah. it i've had to learn that the hard way and let go of a few things but i just always believe if you do, if you're doing exactly what you love, it don't matter what anyone else thinks. Were they supportive of you? The other, yeah. So all of them, were they like, oh my God, this is amazing? They didn't need to support by then. The job was done. I, I think I was called the 20, 26 carat diamond by then. So I was given that sort of, I was given that sort of like stature anyway, yeah. that I was still put on a pedestal. And so when it come to me being solo, it was, it was easier than what it probably would have been if I came out without them. See, I've listened to your debut album and obviously you had the singles were a success. Yeah. When you put the album out there, it didn't do as well, no. you know? So were you surprised in the sense of the singles are doing well, the album isn't? Because the album's strong. No. You know? Do you know why I wasn't surprised? Because my record label, not to slander them because they were wonderful and they gave me a quarter of a million pounds for my very first deal. I was very fortunate. I got one of the last biggest deals that any solo artist ever have ever had my videos alone were the most expensive out of the entire entire so solid catalog you paid like I'm a quarter so, of a million pounds for yeah, one video, for yeah just my one video is quarter of a million and i'm so grateful to that but they also thought because i came from such a, a huge 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 record with so solid crew that it was going to sell itself they had um what was his name travis yeah. A, a, an artist called Travis. They had a few other artists. They also bought JD and Asha D on records, on, on record deals. So they had spent a massive budget on getting us. And I think they just thought it's going to sell itself because we sold so well, we so solid. And my first single, as I said, had sold 90,000 copies in just two or three days. I was at number two, I think it's 400 behind busted at number one so we had sold an extreme amount so they just thought oh this, the album's just gonna do it so they just sort of relaxed and obviously that's never gonna work because you're still gonna yeah. sell it every week a new artist is gonna come out and i just think they just got relaxed and i remember saying like am i not gonna do the same promo as i did with all over being my first single all over was my first single my second single was called in love am i not gonna get the same promo I wasn't on, on radio, tour. I wasn't on school tour. And I was doing half of the amount of stuff I did for my first single. So I could, I, I already could see, and I, as I said, I'm an inexperienced musician. I don't know the ins and outs of, I didn't know at the time, I do now, but at the time I didn't know the ins and outs of how the mechanics behind a record would work. I was learning as I was going along and I just could feel that it was just quarter of the amount of work that I had done with the first single. Yeah. So I knew that my album could be in danger. And it was. It still went gold. I mean, it didn't do that bad. <laughs> did, did you step away from the label? Was it your choice to... So the third single was Women of the World and it didn't do as well. Um, but my singles had going, was going really well. And I was just sort of relaxed by then. I just sort of get was giving up on sort of promo, just yeah. get the album out, let's get this over and done with, let's move on, you know? Um, by then a lot of controversy had happened throughout the So Solid crew. And it was just, yeah, it's just the dynamics of everything had just changed. And I can't think I, I think I kind of quit. And I also had a really tough relationship at that time. I had taken on a 
probably the worst relationship I could have ever taken on at the time. And, um, and it kind of uh, changed me as well. In what, in what sense? So with that relationship, what about the relationship changed you? And why was it? There was so like, much that changed for me. Um, I think I was just under a lot of pressure. I felt like I was um, being suppressed, maybe. The crew had been all broken up by then into pieces that everyone was doing their own sort of thing. I had great success. It didn't change the shape of my career. Um, sorry, it changed the shape of my career because it changed me as a person. Um, but I was still making really good money, but the crew wasn't doing the same. We wasn't doing the same things that we once was. And it just changed everything. So I don't know what nature of that relationship was negative, but I'm assuming. It, so was it, was it an abusive <laughs> relationship, would you say? It was a no. mentally abusive Men relationship. Yeah. So when you're going through something like that, at home in yeah. your private life and then you're having to go on stage and be Lisa Mafia. Is that exhausting? Because one minute you're actually dealing through your real life situation mm. and then you're going, here, here I am, you're doing your dance, you're doing, and then you're going back to that reality. I am such a chameleon. I know how to switch things on and off and I would try my best not to allow it to um, change what I'm doing on the job. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but it made me, as you said, it made me feel drained, emotionally drained and always worried about things. And just also, I am a bit of an empath and empathy can change the way you look at everything and, and who you receive and take into your life. Um, and I sort of embraced anybody that needed help, um, which used and abused who I was, you know. And I think it's that what changed my career and the end of my sort of record deal came to an end because I had quit, because I was probably out of energy. Now I look back, I was probably out of energy and out of um, sort of fending for myself. I was probably giving just everything I got to everyone else and that was including my relationship, unfortunately. Are you angry at that now? <coughs> Is that the time no. maybe you, like you said your mum before, <laughs> being blinded by love, was, was that kind of the same for you? I'm never, I'm never going to be angry about things that have happened. I'm disappointed in myself, but I'm telling you something, it's made such a woman. It's made such, yeah. I was a girl back then, but it's made such a strong woman. And, and it's given me all the necessities I need to put into my daughter. It's given me everything I need to put into business to know that I am, I am strong and I can do it on my own. If I hadn't been through all them awful things, and there were some really awful things that happened, um, had I not experienced that, I don't know if I'd be as tough as I am today, which has enabled me to um, be a businesswoman, be an entrepreneur, being able to be a single mum this whole while um, and continue in a very loving, happy yeah. life now, you know? I mean, people watching this will naturally want me to ask, what kind of things did you go through? You because, nosy buggers. You know, because <laughs> what, what, one thing I've noticed with your career is from when you started off, especially to kind of midway, is this strength of it doesn't matter what something was thrown at you, I can do this. I don't, I don't need a label. I'm going to have my own label. You, you had this kind of fire within you that it didn't matter what people tried to do, nothing was putting you mm. in a box. And, and that's the strength that I think a lot of people find inspirational. So yeah. that's why I'm kind of intrigued what you went through because to still be grinding and moving forward when you're going through that, not many people can do that. So, I, I mean, basically, I did just an outscale uh, outline of everything that's happened and what's affected me and made me who I am. I come from a single parent family growing up in Brixton in South London. We didn't have nothing. We had nothing. And everything that we had, we've had to work really hard for. So that was the first learning curve that Brixton was sort of the university of um, compassion and um, understanding, communication. Um, and you had to have those skills to be able to make it out of somewhere like that, you know, because I saw death, my first death of a shooting of a friend at the age of 12, my first um, rape um, experience was the age of 14 it, it's it's those things if you don't come out of them areas with the ability to communicate and to thrive and to trust and to fight and to just keep on going no matter what you will be there forever 
And I've come out into the music industry with that same mentality yeah. that I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back there. And I'm not, I'm not going back there. And I did, honestly, I did fall into, I think maybe with daddy issues <clears throat> because my dad wasn't around. Excuse me. My dad wasn't around. I think I fell into um, my first relationship with an older guy because of those daddy issues of wanting a man to protect and love and to be able to give me that adult life, escaping my mum and her boyfriend that I hated, um, escaping the life that my mum had sort of, it sort of became within my mum's household, is to run to an older man. And I did, and he was abusive, unfortunately. And then, and then sort of going into the music industry thinking, okay, it's my turn to being given a quarter of a million pound. Can you imagine? I'd love it. At 19 <laughs> years old. We don't get £2.50 in the Cornwall Channel. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, at 19 year old being given, uh, sorry, 21 years old and my solo deal and um, being given um, a quarter of a million pounds. You think you have all this control because of money because I'd never had it before. And before that, I didn't want to leave my daughter um, at 17 years old, I had my daughter and I didn't want to leave my daughter. So I took a job where I could take her to work with me in a local off license and took her for, to work with me for every, every single day until I became famous and couldn't work there anymore. So it, those that I've seen a lot in the, in this form of traumatic scenarios. Like, I mean, what was I doing in working in a off license? in my local area with my daughter at 17 year old, trying to play adult as a kid, bringing up a kid. Well, you know, you said obviously 17 years old is very young to become a mum. Yeah. Did you have loads of ideas in your head of, oh, I don't want this to happen because in my, I didn't have a dad. Did, were you so conscious of what you were going to give your daughter? Uh, um, did you kind of want to not have the same thing that you had? I didn't want to have the same scenario repeat again but I was also very desperate to have my own family because I felt like I lost mine wow yeah because I in my mum's house my sister also had a child quite young and um in my mum's house it was my mum and her boyfriend in one room and then my sister and her boyfriend and her son in the same room as me in separate beds opposites um and I just felt like the spare wheel how to say that out loud? I mean, yeah. even hearing it, it's kind of like heartbreaking. So for yeah. you now, years on to actually say those words, like I wanted a family because kind of you feel lonely. That's Yeah, that's I just really... felt like I didn't, because it's my, sister dad, my sister's dad that was around as well. So that was really difficult as well because it wasn't my dad, but I sort of latched onto him as my father. Um, so I just always felt like a spare wheel once I got to that age. I know why I escaped it is because I actually was really desperate to have my own family and start my own sort of little life. Um, I just started it really bloody young and, uh, and had to just go through the motions. But I'm telling you something, at 17 years old, when you're having a baby, you really grow up. I was going to ask, what changed for you? Because What changed for me? I got my first mom. flat, first house, my own front door key by 18 years old. Wow. So and I was you, ready for it. You've got a lot we to be happy. proud of. Yes. You have. I was. I, I, I am. I still am. Um, by, the, by the time my daughter was four, she is actually the little girl at the beginning of 21 seconds. Yeah. Of year. You know that. Does she get royalties for that? She does indeed. <laughs> she does indeed. Not only mummy's the bank of mummy, but she also gets a PRS. Yeah, she does. Um, I was just determined to... I, want to, I don't want to say do better because my mum done the best she could, you know? And she was a fabulous mum. There was nothing we actually went without. I mean, we didn't get it as quick as maybe some of the other people with mum and dad at home and jobs and all the rest of it. But we used to, like, my mum used to save up. And we used to, like, the Jordans. I remember the Jordans came out, Jordan trainers. And I want, she, my sister wanted the Jordans and I wanted um, 90s, Air Max 90s. And I was so determined to have these. And they were like, when I think about it, it was 130 pounds. That's a lot. That then. is a yeah. lot of money. Did you get them? My mum got them for us for Christmas. Oh, wow. She saved up all year. By then it was probably out of fashion, but we didn't care. <laughs> you know when, when you became a mum, were there yeah. times where you reflect and it made you appreciate just what your mum did? Oh my gosh, yeah, every day. Because 
But then to be honest, Lou, I, I was so young, you kind of get resilient to anything like that. You would consciously think of these things as when you get older, but at that young, you kind of just do it. Yeah. It's it's like nothing's a struggle. It I don't remember it ever feeling like, oh my god, what have I done? I just was kind of just doing it. It's it's like you have this supernatural power. It's this superpower that you can just do whatever because you're young. It's like, I'll work it out. Yeah. And as I said, I was so desperate to be grown up because I I wanted to be grown up so I could do it myself and rely on myself and not feel like I need, I wanted to have my sister back without her baby and without a boyfriend. I wanted to have my mum back without her boyfriend. I want my family back. Instead of doing that, I just kind of grew up and got my own. Um, I know you've been very open, uh, especially in interviews, about your mum and and her health uh, and cancer, which that must have been the worst because it seems like you and your mum are so close. So when did your mum first get diagnosed? It's now 13 years ago, 2010, 11-ish. Um, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer, unfortunately. Um, that has spread all over her body now. But she was told in 2010 that she would be here for maximum six months. And my mom's here 13 years later. Unfortunately, at this present, it's just come back. And um, it is quite, it's quite what they call it, aggressive. Um, and um, it's tough because my mum's had maximum treatment now, maximum radio, radiotherapy, maximum of everything. But she's okay. And there's always hope for my mum because if there is a um, one person on this earth that... Um, Cancer treatment is made for is my mum. She is like the prototype of what what chemo is made for, honestly. Uh, yeah, she's a strong woman as well. Um, I've noticed now as I've got older and my mum's been going through cancer so long that um, my mum is a damaged woman as well. And a lot of what she feels and what she does and how she acts is because of the trauma that she's experienced herself. And that has, has also gone through cancer because it's her mindset of that. You ain't going to beat me. So she's got that strength, the same as what you've So I know that's got, where yeah. I got it from. And as much as trauma isn't nice, it's made us bloody strong women. That's what I wanted to ask you when we spoke earlier. I said I wanted to go back to your mum because the theme that stands out through your career was nothing gets you down. You know, it does a lot of people. I've been in moments in my life where I thought I've, I'm done. You know, I, I, I haven't got that in me. And... But you just get back up and you keep going. And it sounds like your mum's done that because, you know, to, to get that diagnosis, uh, diagnosis 13 years ago and to be told you, you, you don't have long left, it, I would feel like I'm constantly expecting, like, uh, my mum to go, you know? Mm. I couldn't imagine what that's like because it's like a constant, I, I'm, I'm going to lose you any moment because of what someone said. And, like, 13 years is so long mm. and she's still here, she's still strong. I think that's why, I mean, I think I would have been a lot more tearful a few years ago. Um, But I've actually built up this resilience because I know my mum is going to have the best life that she can get out of this because she's so determined. And I've learned that I'm actually that determined as well, that there's so many things that brings me to tears and breaks my heart. And I think, why, why me, why me? But it's the life that we've lived that tells us, oh my God, I can do this. Yeah. I can do anything. You can do anything. Especially as strong women, you can seriously do anything if you put your mind to it. I want to give you a hug. Yeah. You're so inspirational. See? You really are. Yeah. It's, just, it's just a build up of um, resilience that has got my mum through. And I think to myself, I have no right crying to know, I said before in an interview that I always felt really guilty for feeling like I'm living, waiting for my mum to die. And I still feel very guilty for that. Because she is living. Yeah. It's not easy. It's hard. It's very not hard. easy. And I just think, okay, God, okay. So I have no right crying because she goes, she's battling cancer that can take her out any day. 
And we have no prediction of that because you can't see what's happening on the inside of your body, you know? So it's so important to just live. And that's what's kept me going. It's the importance of making sure you live your fullest every day, no matter what's going on, no matter what it is, just live. Live and be happy because you never know what your days are, you know? Your days are numbered. If there's one thing in this world that we know is that yeah. we're all going to go. Well, you've made her proud. I mean, you, you, I mean, and <laughs> talk about living, living your best life. You did that on celebrity coach trips. So. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Um, you didn't watch that, did you? I did you watch it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love everything like that. All of those but, shows I've done for mum to raise money for cancer research. Yeah. Because yeah. you get that, don't you, from when you do the shows as a celebrity? Yes. You get, yeah. Yeah, you can choose your charities, yeah. Was that the same with as Celeb Air? You. Celeb the most, Air. The most random oh, show on TV. The most um, random. No, what? That wonder it wasn't aired twice. I mean, <laughs> hello. Celeb. But I really, I really enjoyed that. Do you, you know why I was actually, I won it. And I was also a fully fledged, uh, what's it called? Aviation. I was a fully fledged aerostess for a year, two years or four years after that show as well. Because of the show? Yeah. You had to take real aviation. What? Yeah. Because you couldn't, you couldn't fly because she was actually replacing staff heiress their staff so you had to have i flunked it the first time around they's like lisa you've not passed your test so you can't fly and i was like what and it's like we're gonna give you another <laughs> chance because we really want you on the show so i had to take all these bloody tests again and then i passed <laughs> if you rang your mum now and said i've been asked to do any tv show but you choose what tv show would your mum love you she to do? chose uh, that bloody show. What was that show? I hunted. Oh, she chose that. She chose that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, she loves that show. Um, yeah, and it was inc- it was incredible. So you would like ring her and say, "I've been offered this. Should I do it?" And then she, yeah. well, no, I said I said to her, I said to her, "What shows do you like?" Because I knew I had the show, and I, as I said, I do something once big a year on TV surrounding a cancer charity whether it's a race for life or a big tv show i've done full monty's got my boobs out for the boys uh i did that and i did um celeb coach trip and the hunted as well and celeb um what's the other one remember the back what's the one back in the day i even put that to charity um sports where i met you jackie what go on jackie what was it (laughs) <laughs> it's a sports one where all can the games. games. Oh, a few of you from So Solid. Yes, me, yes. Romeo and Harvey yeah. all done that. Um, but again, that was a show that I put my money towards, even though my mom didn't have cancer back then. Imagine that. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, I just thought about that. That's I could see weird. that. You've never thought of it because that's just hit you. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. That was that's really strange. But maybe we all know what was really going on in it. I think God has a lot to do with that. <laughs> um, do you still keep in touch with a, a lot of the So Solid guys? Not all. Um, my favourite and my my right hand man Romeo. is Romeo. Yeah. Uh, we tour together. We do most performances together. Um, and we're in touch daily. We, we know each other's children and things like that. So, yeah, that's... Um, that's my most important member. Harvey? Harvey, now and then, not too much. Um, he just is doing his own thing. And musically, myself and Romeo are the only two from So Solid that had successful. We, I mean, a few of the others had solo albums, but we had successful solo yeah. albums. Um, I know bit that sounds really a little bit there. harsh. Yeah, ours was actually really successful. Flex, hey, Gary! <laughs> no, but you know, when you think of, when I think of myself, I think, okay, I sold 90,000. I don't think... But Harvey sold any... I don't know! I don't know! Real! Harvey, I'm sorry. I don't mean to real at you, but I'm just trying to rate myself, you know? I'm out here defending my own. Unlike you, I had a successful album. Unlike you guys. <laughs> what about Asher? Because he's gone out and he's done incredible. Oh my I mean, God, he's incredible, Have you he? watched Top Boy? I'm not going to lie, I haven't. It's... I mean, you know when you were so talking good. about... What you got, like, when you were growing up and you... Yeah. It sounds... Some of the scenes that you just described in this interview reminds me of episodes... Okay, so the only thing I don't like about British black TV is that they over-exaggerate their... Part. They're like, yeah, get me! And all that. I'm like, what the fuck is no that? Talk, yeah. No one talks like that in the hood. So, I don't know. I feel like it's just so over-exaggerated that it kind of irritates me. But I, I think I've watched everything else Asha D has done and it's 
incredible. Do you keep in touch with him? Yes. Are you still really well, good friends? Well, not, not that much anymore, but I think it's just like difference of lives, isn't it? He's not into doing music and he's doing acting. I don't do acting. So maybe we've got nothing to talk about, but we have been out. We Out of everyone, I've had a lot of contact with him as well over the years. Nice. Yeah. Um, one I interviewed before, I don't know if you know it, because I noticed he likes a lot of your stuff, but I interviewed a few months ago Wiley, and he was oh, brilliant. Wiley. I mean, it was a really good interview. Yeah. Um, do, How do did you... it go? Was it crazy? Really good. I mean, a very <laughs> misunderstood guy. Yes, he is. You know, he gets a lot of negative. He is, um, he's a very well-educated, um, calculated guy, more than people realise. Yeah. Really, really cool guy. Well, we, i got to talk. How have you gone from being a hugely more successful than Harvey, as you've mentioned, um, <laughs> solo artist? Why are you saying that? <laughs> Harvey's <laughs> cool. Listen, Harvey is cool too. I love Harvey. Yes, good. Um, you, uh, hugely solo, uh, successful solo artist. But rum? You're now a businesswoman, yes. an entrepreneur, and you've got your own rum. Yes. How did that come about? So business in general, I start from the beginning of business. Business came about... Firstly, with my booking agency, UC Bookings. I started out because I took a dip in my career and I realized, oh my God, what money do I have? And I was like, no way are we taking a dip. So I opened my own agency. I called it UC Bookings because it stands for Undercover Agent, Undercover Bookings. I emailed that to get you on the show. Did you? Yeah, yeah so that's actually been, that was established in 2008, I think it was, 2007, 2008. Um, and I, as I said, I took a dip in my career and I just, the shows just stopped. Well, in fact, the shows didn't stop. My management stopped working for me. So I started working for myself, collecting data and emailing them, pretending that I was my own agent. And I, back then I called myself Selena and I was like, hello, I'm Selena. Would you like to work with Lisa Murphy on your next production? If you'd like to book a, get in touch and send them all my music and photos of myself and stuff. And it just started working. And I was like, oh my gosh. But I just was working for myself. I was just getting, doing it to get myself bookings. And then I, um, and it started working so well. They started asking for other artists within the UK garage scene. And I realized, oh my God, I think this is my first business. I just carried on acting as an agent called Selena and booking for a number of different people from Chipmunk to Wiley. I've booked for before, Lethal B I've booked. Um, all of the Gary scene, Luck in the Art for Dodger, Oxide and Trino, wow. absolutely everybody. And that was the first port of core of business. And then I opened House of Mafia and House of Mafia was an online hub for upcoming brands, um, fashion brands, um, because I was wearing a lot of upcoming brands and then um, they wasn't getting the sort of, the sort of, exposure that I would expect because I wasn't so much in the press by then. I was just on stage and making money other ways. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't social media back then, you know, so you had yeah. to get your clothes on a celebrity for it to get noticed. And I ended up um, establishing House of Mafia as this portal for up upcoming brands to, to sort of showcase their, bra their, their clothing. And I ended up dressing a few people for the red carpet, through my contacts, for the Mobos. And then my mum got cancer. And then I, I, I couldn't concentrate. And it was go going really well. It was like two years in and it was going really well. I had a whole team of, of uh, people working behind me and it was going great. And my mum got cancer and I couldn't concentrate. So I closed it and I thought, when well, mum's better, I open it. But it had this weird sort of attachment to my mum and cancer. And I felt like if I ever opened it again, it's going to bring up my mum's cancer. Yeah. It's just some stupid thing I mentally channeled into my brain. And so I just never opened it again. And I moved on. Opened a couple of other, you know, failed businesses and um, tried to work with different people. Started doing events, which was great. And that got me into the club scene. Um, done my very first uh, event called Pure Sugar in St. Albans with my then, once then uh, business partner called Harry. And um, we'd done that event and it got locked off by police because there was this <laughs> stigma about So Solid still around. Wow. I know. And I All didn't know years. it. All, and I was playing on multiple stages every weekend yeah. but when it came to me doing my own event um there was this the police locked it off and i come to find out it was a promoter down the road that's made an anonymous call saying there's going to be a shoot in there and that's why they closed me but it so happens that that sort of led me down the garden path of being a promoter so i started doing my own events and that's where the rum idea came from because i was in these bloody clubs drinking all this alcohol that i didn't want to drink i didn't 
like the taste of. I didn't, I'm not a massive drinker, but then I'm a huge drinker if I like it. If I'm in yeah. the right atmosphere, I'm like, yes, bring it on, let's drink, you know. But all the while I'm drinking alcohol that I don't really like the taste of. So I decided to make something I just be proud of and something I like to drink. Um, and I created, and I wanted to create the Mafia Rum brand. And, and I didn't really know how, and I was approached to become um, a partner in a distillery. And I was like, nah, not for me. And then it was like, okay, make your own rum. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And then after five years of distilling a, br- a rum that tasted right, I started yeah. to mix the ingredients with um, ingredients from my homeland, Jamaica, um, and created Mafia Rum. And how was it performing? <laughs> like, you know, sales-wise, is it, uh, can you get it in supermarkets? So, is it online only? No, so it's online only at present, but you can also get it at Booker, um, HT Drinks. Um, and it's soon to be in, I'm not going to say, but because it always sometimes goes wrong, doesn't yeah. it, when you say it? Um, so it's going to be in some major retailers very soon. Any celebrities that have... Celebrity endorsements thus far is Jammer from BBK. Nice. Um, I've had... Yeah. Boy Better Know, isn't it? Yeah, Boy yeah. Better Know. Is that, yeah, I say BBK. Is that... Yeah. Oh, yes, Boy Better Know, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, I, I was just trying to make sure I understood. I couldn't remember then. <laughs> uh, I forgot what it stands for, but I'm always saying BBK. Um, Oxide Trino, Arthur Dodger, Lucky Nick, Kelly Lou Oh, so you've got lots, yeah. Beanie Man, so many people have got it in their hands, yeah. And it's doing really well in the UAE as well, in Dubai. So I'm really looking forward to it being as big as it is there here. Um, I'm heading towards um, some really big deals. Um, we're almost there. Oh, Working well done. Me, I'm really uh, excited for you. Very you. Much. I've got to say, I was on TikTok um, a few weeks ago, yeah. scrolling through my videos, and I'm like, hang on. Anthony Joshua, the <laughs> best boxer in the world, probably the best looking guy in the world. Yes. <laughs> and he's on stage performing 21 seconds. Yes. How did it come about? And um, why and yeah, how? Okay, so that's actually the second time that guy's got on stage with me. The first time was a few years ago back um, yeah, I don't know what year it was, but it was Garage Nation. He just randomly turned up to Scala in King's Cross. And I, um, it's so wild because I was actually on stage on my own because Romeo um, got stuck in traffic and wasn't able to make it. So I was on stage on my own at Garage Nation and Anthony Joshua took it upon himself to say, I was looking around and I looked at him and he was singing all the words and I was like, I get him a mic, get him a mic. And they gave him the mic and he came out. <laughs> it was hilarious. And then this one, he, that was, he's actually got a, a really cool charity um, that I'm going to give you the name to after. I can't actually remember what it's called, but he's got a cool charity that's based in Luton, um, a Watford, I think it is actually. And um, it's supporting communities um, in the area he once grew up in. And he actually, for his own festival, it's called Cool Kids Festival. Um, and he had booked all these artists, booked and had all his team come down. It was a really lovely night, day out. And he and he jumped on stage with us again, with me and Romeo this time. He That's loves insane. it. He loves a bit of rapping. He wants to be a musician. I think he's missed his calling. Are you friends with him then? Is he <laughs> yes, your friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was going to say, because you look like you got on really well on the stage. Yeah, so I was like, hang on, these guys are close. Yeah, I, I mean, I got the... Um, I got people saying, oh, it looks like you and him have done something and all the rest of it. But he is such, just a nice guy. He's just really got a really nice air about him and um, cares yeah. about his community. And he just, lo- I think he just loves his life. I wish I was his age and got like done the things that he did. That's just love life. You got it. There's a few lessons in what he is. What's next for you now? Because I know yesterday, I mean, you were doing, when we spoke on WhatsApp, you were doing multiple shows. I thought yeah, it might be hence, one, but yeah. <laughs> hence why my throat is still strained because uh, this week and amongst the whole of July, whole of June, um, there's been minimal of five gigs a weekend. Yesterday I had five gigs. I was all over the place, a lot of festivals, a lot of uh, driving, a lot of traveling. I think I left home yesterday at 10 a.m. and I got home at three at 2 a.m. Wow. So and then you came day. here. Yes, and then I came straight here. I wouldn't have missed this for the world. <laughs> Do you know, sometimes when I, you know, do interviews, as an interviewer, I learn stuff. And one thing that I've learned from you today is you've actually got to go out and get it. Don't just expect, sometimes I, I'll be on a bit of a roll and I'm, I sit back and I just think, oh, what's going to come? And then it, things dry up. But actually, 
what I've learned from you today is that you've just got to actually go out and get it yourself. And you've got this such a strong work ethic. Thank you. Which is why I think, so yeah, one of my favourite interviews, I think you're incredible with how you've kept going despite struggles. And then, yeah, you've definitely make your uh, children proud. I just think proud. in life, be proud of yourself. Yeah. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks. I think I spent so many, so many years worried about what others' opinion is of me. And that can tear you down. It can slow you down as well. God will always support you if you're doing the right things in life. But you've also, God ain't going to just go and do it for you. He isn't going to take your hand to go mm. and, and carry you to that opportunity. You've got to be ready for those and you've got to take opportunities as they come and learn to just be thankful for what you've got because you'll get a lot more out of life. Well, Lisa Mafia, thank you so much for joining us on Live Stories. This is Lisa Mafia, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>